This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 111, Moko Rangito Heredi, part one. In 2015, single mom of three, Nicola Dali Packy's oldest child needed to be hospitalized with a severe infection. She couldn't leave him alone in the hospital, but she had no family nearby who could care for her two younger children, aged seven and three. With few options, Nicola asked her longtime friend, Tanya Shaler, to care for the kids for a while. She had no idea she was leaving her children in the care of a monster and her equally monstrous partner, David Heidiwa. This is the story of a loving boy with a wide, infectious smile who spent the last weeks of his short life enduring unthinkable torture, pain, and violence. It's also the story of two child killers whose inadequate charges led to ridiculously light sentences for a crime widely considered one of the worst child killings in New Zealand's history. This is part one of the disturbing story of Moko Rangito Hiriri. Before I get started, I'd like to thank my newest patrons, Savannah B. from Temple, Texas, Kristen M. from Laurel, Montana, Madeline F. from Onalaska, Wisconsin, Jana S. from Botanic Ridge, Victoria, Australia, and from Neverland, thank you to Adrian S. and Linda M. I appreciate all of you and your support more than I can tell you. I'm hoping to be able to focus on the podcast full-time on a permanent basis going forward, because there's no way I can keep doing this while also working a full-time job, so every pledge gets me closer to that goal, and I thank you all for your help. To make a pledge, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. I've been asked by several people to cover a case from New Zealand, so I'll be doing that today for the first time. I have to apologize in advance for pronouncing any names or words incorrectly, although I did my very best and used multiple sources to try to ensure I pronounced everything the best I could. It's always interesting to me to cover cases from other countries besides the United States where I live or Canada where I grew up because in addition to learning another child's story, it also gives me the opportunity to learn about a whole different culture and way of life. I'm the CEO of Falling Down Research Rabbit Holes, so whenever I take on an international story, I spend endless hours sifting through all these fascinating details to supplement the case I'm covering. This is definitely one of those, and I'm sorry in advance for any pronunciations I might mangle. A quick warning before we get started. Some of the details you'll hear in this story are incredibly graphic and brutal. The torment this little boy endured in the last weeks of his life defies imagination, but as you all know, that's never stopped me before. Moko deserves to have his story told. New Zealand is a Pacific Island country of about 4.5 million people located approximately 1,200 miles or 2,000 kilometers east of Australia. Its most populous city is Auckland, but its capital city is Wellington. New Zealand itself, which consists of two main islands and over 700 smaller islands, is located at one corner of the Pacific region called the Polynesian Triangle. At the Triangle's other corners are Easter Island and Hawaii, and within the triangle are the islands of Samoa and Tahiti. The islands of New Zealand were the last large, habitable landmass to be populated by humans when, beginning in the 13th century, Polynesians began to settle there, developing a distinctive culture and becoming known as the Maori people. According to Polynesian mythology, the islands were settled by tribes from Hawaii, who arrived by canoe and dubbed their new home Aotearoa, which means the land of the long white clouds. The name New Zealand came about when the Dutch explorer Abel Tasman arrived on the Maori-occupied island in 1642 and decided to name it after the province of Zeeland in the Netherlands. 
The Maori culture centers around the iwi or tribe, hapu or subtribe, and fano or family. The iwi is ruled by a rangatira or chief. Present-day Maori people still consider their allegiance to their tribal groups an integral part of their identity. The focal point of the individual Maori community is the marae, or meeting grounds, which belongs to a particular iwi, hapu, or fano. The marae is a fenced-in complex of buildings that sometimes display beautiful, intricate carvings both outside and in. The language of the Maori people is Te Reo Maori. In New Zealand, over 95% of the population speaks English, which is similar in accent and dialect to Australian English. In 1987, Te Reo Maori was declared one of the country's official languages, although it is currently spoken by under 5% of the population. Despite attempts after World War II to discourage the use of Maori language and the practice of its culture, the Maori culture has been revitalized over the past few decades, and New Zealand now offers Maori language immersion schools called Kohanga Reo, or language nests, as well as two TV channels that broadcast predominantly in Maori. My inner Marvel fangirl will not allow me to move forward without mentioning that the director of the two most recent Thor movies, Taika Waititi, is of Maori descent. Maori culture is rich and varied and includes both traditional and modern art forms. Some of the modern Maori arts include film, television, art, poetry, theater, and hip-hop music. Traditional arts including carving, weaving, kapahaka or group performances, Faikareiro or oratory performance, and moko or tattoo. In Maori, the word moko has multiple meanings. Primarily, a moko is a traditional Maori tattoo, which is an extremely personal and unique piece of art that can be considered a powerful and revealing glimpse into a Maori person's identity. Moko can be applied to any part of the body and used to be placed using traditional methods, including chisel blades dipped in pigment and struck into the skin with mallets. Commonly, moko are now applied using a modern tattoo needle. The face is the most sacred part of the body to place a moko, and a Maori facial tattoo is called a moko kawai. Men's moko kawai often cover the entire face, whereas women's are generally placed on the chin and lips. The word moko can also mean a reptile such as a lizard, skink, or gecko, and as the shortened form of moko puna is also used as a term of address for a grandchild or other young child by an older person. In this episode, I'm going to tell you about a little boy who was actually named Moko and whose name has become synonymous with one of the worst child abuse murders in New Zealand's history. Moko Savia Ringito Hadedi was born on October 14, 2011, to 22 year old Nicola Dali Paki and 24 year old Karana Ringito Hadedi Sr., who goes by the name of Jordan. Moko, the youngest of three children, was an utterly adorable little boy with short black hair, sparkling brown eyes, glowing tawny brown skin, and a wide smile that showed off his perfect baby teeth and lit up his round little face. The relationship between Moko's parents was turbulent. Nicola was just 19 when she married Jordan in 2008, and on their wedding night, she made the disturbing realization that her husband was a member of the Black Power Gang when he pulled his gang patch out from under the bed, the image of a closed fist. Black Power is a prominent gang in New Zealand, which as a country is thought to have one of the highest gang membership rates in the world. Members of the Black Power gang are mainly Maori and Polynesian. The gang is heavily involved in organized crime activity like drug manufacturing and dealing. Unfortunately, along with gang membership goes a propensity for violence, including high levels of domestic abuse. Jordan was convicted in 2009 of assaulting his wife. He was convicted again in 2013 and yet again in 2014, and between convictions, the police were summoned multiple times to their home for domestic violence. Near the end of 2014, Nicola had had enough, taking her three kids and fleeing the family home in Tokoroa to live in Auckland near friends and family. Around this time, her older son fell out of a tree and broke his leg. After being treated for the fracture, the boy was sent home, but before long, his mom took him back to the hospital. She later said, I knew something wasn't right. It was more than the leg. His eyes were rolling. He had a really high temp, so I took him back. Within 24 hours, they decided to do an MRI scan, but by then, it was too late. The MRI discovered there was a hairline fracture in his knee. As it turned out, the hairline fracture, which had been missed by the initial x-ray, caused a severe blood infection, a heart murmur, and a serious bone disease and the boy was readmitted to the Starship Children's Hospital in Auckland for what would turn out to be several long admissions. 
Each time he was admitted, Nicola had to remain at his bedside because, of course, she couldn't leave her child alone in the hospital. However, this was a constant stress for multiple reasons, including financial difficulty and constantly having to find someone to care for her two younger children. Nicola had no immediate family close by. Her brother lived up north, her mother and twin sister lived in Australia, and she had a cousin, Zena, in Hamilton, but even that was nearly two hours from Auckland. The family she did have nearby owned their own businesses, making it impossible for them to care for Nicola's two younger children for any significant length of time. Nicola applied for a room at the Auckland Ronald McDonald House, a worldwide organization that provides emergency accommodations for families with sick children. But she was declined because of the family's gang ties, as well as her history of domestic violence with the children's father. She was placed on a waiting list for government-subsidized housing, and in the meantime, out of desperation, Nicola spent three weeks sneaking three-year-old Moko and his seven-year-old sister into the hospital to spend the night. A social worker from the Auckland District Health Board referred Nicola to a national domestic violence organization called SHINE. In February and again in May of 2015, the District Health Board also made reports about Nicola's situation to Child Youth and Family, the government's child protection agency. There weren't any specific concerns for her children's safety, but the reports mentioned past family violence as well as current stress including financial difficulties and the instability of the children moving back and forth between homes. Senior DHB social worker LaShawn Paramal later said, It became clear during this admission that the paucity of social, fano, and financial resources impacted Ms. Dally Packey's ability to provide a safe and stable environment for her children. This, Nicola maintains, was absolutely untrue. Now I'm going to shift gears and introduce you to the real-life villains of Moko's story. Tanya Shaler was a longtime friend of Nicola's. After Tanya's partner and the father of her three youngest children, David Haidiwa, was sent to jail in 2013, Tanya escaped the reportedly abusive relationship and fled with their four children, turning to a Maori women's refuge in Taranga for help. From there, Housing New Zealand, a government agency providing rental housing for people in need, placed the family into a three-bedroom home at 49 Marshall Avenue in Taupo, a town of 26,000 in the central North Island. The three children Tanya shared with David were five, four, and two, and the eldest, David's child, was seven. When Tanya and the children moved into the home in Taupo, her new neighbor, who later spoke to the New Zealand Herald on condition of anonymity, felt sympathy for the woman living in the home, which the neighbor described as sunny and quiet, unusual considering the four young kids living there. The neighbor said, When she moved in, I felt sorry for her. A single mom, no car with four children all the way out here. She had just the basics, and I thought she was new to this town. She spoke in soft tones, and I thought she was a really nice girl. I know how hard it is to be a single mom with four children, because I've been there for a little while, and I offered her, if you ever need any help, just ask. The neighbor said that what she saw of Tanya was a loving mother who sang and danced with her children. The curtains were always open, and she could often see Tanya cuddling with the children on the couch or drawing and coloring at a table. In Tanya's home, there was no internet and no satellite TV or Freeview, the country's free television platform, but from what the neighbors said, Tanya and the kids watched movies together. Tanya walked the kids to school and kindergarten every morning, and afterward she picked them up and walked them back home again. Tanya was a parent helper at the school, and when she wasn't occupied with that, she kept busy taking adult education classes toward her National Certificate of Educational Achievement, or NCEA, studies. Tanya studied English, maths, history, and home economics through the Rural Education Activities Program, or REAP. Hoping to earn a degree with the goal of working in social services, which is a disturbing detail considering where this story is headed. In June of 2015, a head teacher at the kindergarten where Tanya's children went made a report of concern to a counselor at Family Works, which is a charitable organization providing services to children and families. Although the teacher thought Tanya was a capable parent, it was apparent she needed urgent help for depression and social needs. As I mentioned, Tanya Shaler and Nicola Dali Packy were longtime friends. Nicola was just 16 when she met Tanya who was a co-worker of the mother of Nicola's future husband, Jordan. Jordan's mother, Nikki Rengita Hidedi, was a relief kayako, or substitute teacher, at Kohangareo, which is a Maori language immersion preschool, and Nikki helped Nicola get a job as a reliever as well. 
At the time, Tanya was a caregiver at the school. Because Tanya was a friend and a trained early childhood teacher, when Nicola's older son once again had to be hospitalized, she reached out to Tanya, asking her to care for her seven-year-old daughter and three-year-old Moko. Nicola later said, I thought there was stability there for my children to settle for the time being until we got him on the recovery path. That's what made me reach out to her. She had to think about it, and she contacted me the next day. She was willing to help with open arms. Nicola thought her kids would be in good hands, not knowing her friend had a dark side, including an ongoing struggle with depression and a rising inability to cope with the demands of life and motherhood in particular. Just a few days after the teacher's report of concern regarding Tanya's needs, Nicola left her two younger children at the house in Taupo. The two women kept in frequent contact by phone and by text. According to the anonymous neighbor, about a year after Tanya and the children moved into the Marshall Avenue house, David Haidewa, fresh out of prison, joined the family in Taupo. This seems to be around July of 2015, while Moko and his sister were staying with Tanya, who didn't want her family to know she and David were back together because her family hated the reportedly abusive man for obvious reasons. Once settled in, David sometimes walked the children to school. He had to report regularly to what the neighbor assumed was the probation service, but otherwise, he sat home all day. Tanya's neighbor found out the family had taken in two additional children when Tanya began asking for help more frequently. She still didn't hear any shouting or yelling, and the family seemed peaceful. Things were not peaceful inside the home, however. During the time Nicola's children lived with Tanya and David, for whatever reason, the couple began to dislike Moko. Within the home, a culture of violence evolved against Moko, small acts of abuse making way for much more egregious offenses. Tanya would punch, kick, and slap him. On one occasion, another child saw her biting the toddler multiple times on his face and arms with so much force that his skin broke and his face bled. David, too, got into a routine of abusing Moko. He kicked, slapped, threw, and booted the three-year-old, and sometimes beat him with a jandal, which is a thong sandal or what we would call a flip-flop in the U.S., He would slap Moko in the face and body with the shoe, even causing lacerations on his cheeks and lips. He frequently kicked Moko, sometimes picking him up and throwing him onto his bed, which was just a mattress on the floor. When he wasn't physically abusing Moko, David disliked the boy being in his presence, so he constantly put him in time out, which consisted of being locked alone in the bathroom for hours or even days at a time. In early July, Jordan's mother, Nikki Rangito Hedidi, approached CYF to make arrangements to take her grandkids to see their dad, at which time she found out the children were staying with Tanya Shaler. Nikki, who knew about Tanya's background, was immediately concerned and began asking questions of CYF, who told her there was an investigation pending on Nicola. Nikki was concerned about the kids staying with Tanya, but there were various court orders in place, so for her to intervene, she would have to obtain a letter of support from their mother. She reached out to her former daughter-in-law and offered to care for her grandchildren, but Nicola declined, saying she wanted to pick the kids up from Taupo, where they were staying. By this time, multiple agencies were working with Tanya to provide assistance, including the Maori Women's Refuge, Family Works, Child Youth and Family, and REAP. Despite the involvement of all of these trained professionals, Tanya was highly skilled at hiding what was going on in her home, including David's presence. Even so, she made comments that, in hindsight, should have been picked up on as red flags by the professionals working with her, including her statements about her depression worsening and struggling with two extra children. During this time, text messages from Tanya to her friends revealed some of her struggle. One such message read, Morning, sis. I was having ugly moments. These other two kids are doing my head in, and my depression is playing up hard out. In mid-July, A family doctor, or GP, in Taupo referred Tanya to a psychiatrist in Rotorua, a city about an hour away. When she attended an appointment with the psychiatrist, she was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder with self-harm tendencies, mood swings, and sleep deprivation. On July 22, 2015, Nicola texted Tanya to say her older son would be discharged from the hospital in three weeks, at which point she would be able to take Moko and his sister off Tanya's hands. You would think knowing there was a light at the end of the tunnel would have taken some of the burden of stress off Tanya's shoulders. In addition to the assistance I've already mentioned, Tanya was also getting help from a family start program through REAP. 
two caseworkers from Family Start visited the home in late July, but they didn't see Moko because he was in timeout in the bedroom. They should have demanded to see him, especially because Tanya was saying she struggled to cope with his behavior. Nicola had been in regular contact with Tanya, but around this time, she was no longer able to reach the woman. Her phone was off and I couldn't call to talk to him. Those are signs that I should have picked up on. Also in July, Tanya had visited the women's refuge and talked to the social worker about concerns about the kids being returned to Nicola, claiming Nicola had gotten back together with her violent husband, which was blatantly untrue. The hypocrisy of this is staggering, considering Tanya was the one who escaped a violent relationship only to take David back immediately upon his release from prison. On July 29, 2015, the refuge social worker took Tanya to Child, Youth, and Family to file a report of concern. The report was given urgent status, which meant a caseworker should have visited Moko and his sister within seven days, but that didn't happen. A lawyer had been appointed by the court to represent the children throughout this whole process, but even the lawyer never visited Tanya's home to see the children. Had anyone checked up on Moko and his sister, this story would have ended very differently. I'll continue after a quick sponsor break. The vicious, prolonged murder of three-year-old Moko began on Wednesday, August 5, 2015, when his abuse by Tanya Shaler and David Hadiwa escalated to the point of no return. On that day, thanks to whatever distorted reasoning occupied Tanya's mind, she attacked the little boy, stomping repeatedly and with significant force on his abdomen. After this savage attack, Moko lost control of his bowel. David later told police they made Moko sit on paper and plastic because he kept shitting. At some point around this time, one of the two adults gave Moko a severe head injury. The brutal blow caused Moko's brain to swell. This, combined with the effect of earlier head injuries they had caused, and the attack on his abdomen, left Moko in an extremely grave state. As the week wore on, Moko grew sicker and sicker. His face began to bruise, consistent with a severe head injury, and he began vomiting. He had no bowel control whatsoever, causing him to defecate spontaneously and frequently, which of course only raised the ire of his abusers. Despite his worsening condition, Tanya had the audacity to attend a counseling session at Family Works while Moko struggled to survive. At this session, Tanya finally mentioned caring for two additional children, telling the counselor she was struggling to cope with Moko and his sister's behavior, referring to them as traumatized children because of their family background. I doubt she gave a second thought to what she and David had put those kids through over the past two months. She also told the counselor that Moko often had bruises from banging his head against the wall. The counselor noted that when she talked about Moko, she looked stressed, tense, angry, and frustrated. An urgent follow-up appointment was scheduled for the following day, but when August 7th rolled around, Tanya was a no-show. By Sunday, August 9th, Moko was in extremely bad shape. His face was significantly bruised and swollen to the point he could barely open his eyes, and he could hardly walk falling frequently to the ground. Even though Tanya and David were home, Moko was locked in his bedroom the entire day. He begged repeatedly for water, which David gave him the first time, but ignored his subsequent pleas. Even though Moko was clearly a very sick little boy, they continued abusing him. At one point, when Moko defecated, which at that point was beyond his control, David kicked him in the lower back and then rubbed the feces in Moko's face. Afterward, David put Moko into the shower, where he washed him so roughly that it removed scabs from his face and body. Moko screamed in pain, and David covered his mouth to keep him quiet. In the shower, Moko fell again and could barely stand up. David helped him stand, only to let him fall to the ground on his face, repeating this three or four times. Noticing Moko's condition declining further, David dried him off, put him in a nappy or diaper, and chucked him back in his bedroom. Even though both Tanya and David were aware of how bad Moko's condition was getting, neither of them sought medical help for the three-year-old, whose breathing was labored, his tummy unnaturally firm from his internal injuries. By the morning of Monday, August 10, 2015, Moko was entirely unable to communicate. Still, nothing was done to help him. That morning, 
Tanya left the house and took her own kids to school. People noted her behavior was out of character, and she smelled of cannabis or marijuana. She also told a friend about Moko running into walls and acting weird and fighting with his sister, as well as falling down the stairs. Tanya spent the rest of the morning home with David, the two of them ignoring Moko's plight. Around noon, Tanya left the house to attend one of her classes. At 2.20 p.m., she got a ride home with a mate, who she asked to stop at a pharmacy, where she tried to buy an EpiPen, which is a device used for injecting a measured dose of epinephrine, a drug most often used for the treatment of anaphylaxis and carried by severe allergy sufferers. The pharmacy did not have EpiPens in stock. Back in the car, Tanya told her friend that the day before, Moko had fallen from the wood pile, but he was okay. The friend told Tanya she should get Moko checked out at Taupo Hospital in case he had a head injury, even offering to drive them there, but Tanya declined. The friend dropped Tanya off at home just before 3 p.m. Upon arriving at home, Tanya found Moko unresponsive and finally decided it was time to do something to help him. While David picked up their kids from school, Tanya gave the three-year-old mouth-to-mouth. When that failed to revive Moko, at 3 p.m., she placed a call to 111, the country's emergency number, telling the operator that Moko had fallen from a woodpile the day before and sustained severe bruising, but had seemed fine until now. She described him as really cold, unconscious, not breathing properly, and said his stomach was really hard. Within minutes, paramedics arrived to find Moko lying face down in the hallway with Tanya kneeling at his feet and David keeping the other children out of the area. I can't begin to imagine how Tanya explained Moko's prone position based on her account of giving him mouth to mouth. The paramedics reportedly took one look at the battered, dying boy, scooped him up, and rushed him immediately to the emergency department at Taupo Hospital. Medical staff made plans to transfer Moko 275 kilometers, or about 171 miles north, to Starship Hospital, where Moko's older brother was recuperating from his severe leg injury. Incredibly, Moko's own mother witnessed the helicopter taking off on its journey to pick up her son. Nicola later said, I actually saw the helicopter fly out that evening, not knowing what it's for. It's just over my son's room where the helicopter takes off, but I didn't know. I thought they were going to save someone's life. Before the helicopter arrived at Taupo Hospital, Moko Sevia Rangito Hadidi was pronounced dead at 10 p.m. on August 10, 2015. Moko's body was transported to the morgue at Starship Children's Hospital in Auckland, where his mother, Nicola, and her cousin, Zena Allen, went to identify him. Moko's brutalized body lay on the table, covered from head to toe in bruises and scrapes, including bite marks on his face. His hard little belly protruded, and his eyes were so swollen that the nurse was unable to lift his eyelids to check his pupils. Nicola, who had no idea the torment her son had endured in the previous weeks, later said, I was down on the ground and that one just knocked me out, seeing my son in the morgue. I wasn't allowed to touch him. It was behind glass and I lost the plot again, not understanding because they didn't actually say what they did to my son. When I saw him, I couldn't even recognize my son. When an autopsy was performed, the pathologist found an unthinkable array of injuries covering Moko's tiny body. He was covered in blunt force injuries, including two black eyes and bruises on his face, neck, multiple ribs, genitals, chest, and abdomen. He had also suffered abrasions on his face, neck, upper lip, ears, chest, and abdomen, and lacerations to his chin, neck, ears, lower lip, gums, and the tissue connecting his lips and gums. Patterned injuries on his cheeks, left arm, right forearm, and right shoulder were indicative of human bite marks. The pathologist could not determine which specific injury actually caused his death, listing multiple, including lacerations and hemorrhaging within his abdomen and older bruising and damage to his bowel, the combination of which caused his intestine to rupture, leaking fecal matter into his abdomen and causing peritonitis and septic shock. Moko had also suffered moderate swelling of the brain, as well as significant hemorrhaging and blood clotting beneath the scalp and between the brain and meninges which indicated multiple injuries had been inflicted over a period of several days. Smothering was also mentioned in the report as partially causing his death. Moko's direct cause of death was listed as multiple blunt force injuries with an antecedent cause of battered child syndrome. The pathologist's report noted, 
While the mechanism of death here is complex, one fact is simple. With prompt medical attention to the signs of physical illness or mental deterioration, such as abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of bowel control, fever, lethargy, or fainting, both the brain swelling and the sepsis could have been either completely prevented or reversed, and Moko could still be alive today. David Hadiwa admitted to police that he had slapped, kicked, and stomped on Moko and would frequently lock the little boy in a bathroom on his own for hours at a time. David explained to investigators that he didn't like Moko's ways and was angry at him for taking us for granted. As for Tanya Shaler, she initially told police that Moko's injuries were a result of him doing things to hurt himself. She also said he fell from the bunk bed and that he would rub his neck against the table and even run into the walls head first. She said the reason she didn't seek medical attention for Moko sooner was because the three-year-old pleaded with her not to take him to the hospital after he had fallen off the woodpile. At that time, he was unable to walk, let alone speak. When investigators spoke to the other children in the house, the kids said they had witnessed a lot of the abuse against Moko, including Moko being punched, kicked, and slapped, as well as being bitten multiple times on the arms and face, with enough force that it caused his skin to come off. Two children witnessed the stomping incident and said it was really, really hard, and that Moko was groaning and expelling bursts of air. They also saw one of the adults place a hand over Moko's mouth, cutting off his air and causing him to kick and thrash his legs. Immediately after Moko's death, his sister was removed from Nicola's custody and taken in for six months by Nicola's cousin, Zena Allen, who was shocked by the things the girl disclosed. She spoke with a reporter in May of 2016 about the psychological torture Tanya and David exacted on the little girl. Tanya even told her, You kicked him. It's your fault he's dead. You killed your brother. She thought that she killed her brother. She made kick her brother while his eyes were rolling back and told her, you did this. So so she's, I hope that she believes that she didn't. I told her that she didn't. I hope that she believes it now. Zena said Moko's sister tried to help him, saying, She told me she would hide Moko in the closet so he wouldn't get a hiding. She would dread going to school because she couldn't protect her brother and she didn't know what state he would be in when she got home. A seven-year-old can sense when to escape so they won't be beaten. A three-year-old cannot. The girl was punished for giving water to Moko and the two would go hungry while everyone else ate. She was allowed to speak to her mom on the phone sometimes but was told that if she said anything about the abuse, they would kill her mom. On the day Moko died, Zena said, Tanya forced his sister to kick a nearly comatose Moko telling her she'd be beaten if she didn't. Do you know how upsetting it is to have a child, an eight-year-old child, tell you she wishes she was killed with her brother and that she wants to kill herself so she won't be sad and miss her mother? I was still calling her Auntie Tans, like, for weeks. She was like, why did Auntie Tans kill my brother? There was other children in this home that were still attending school. The teachers had no idea. Um, The principal of this little girl turned up at the tangy. She had no idea. She seen no signs. She wished like hell that she did. Of the moment she learned about Moko's death, Zena said, I was rung up before it even hit the headlines. I was rung at half past one in the morning from Nicola herself crying that her friend, who she thought was her friend, had killed her baby. I said, how? She said, I don't know. Um, They're bringing his body up here to the morgue. Can you come up with me? I said, yeah, I'll have to. When asked if she knew what the defendants had done to Moko, Zena said, I seen what they did. I dressed him before we laid him to rest. I know what they've done. People are saying, you know, two months is a long time to be away from their mum. But she's she's seen her children in that two months. My dad seen those children in that two months. There were no signs. I would have definitely have looked after her children, but as she keeps on recalling herself, like she doesn't know why this woman hated her or hated her children so much to kill them, and why didn't she tell them, tell her to come pick them up or that she wasn't coping or whatever. There was none of that. Zena said she felt like Nicola was punished for leaving her kids with Tanya. Nicola knew Tanya for years. She was someone she thought she could trust. 
I spoke with her last night, and she's heartbroken. She needs her kids. I just know in my heart that she's a good mum. I know in my heart she'll do anything to protect them now. She's lost one. They need to be held accountable for on their own. They did this. They could have told the teachers at school. They could have told neighbours. They could have told the mother that they weren't coping or they didn't want him. As for that guy, David, he rots me saying that he was taking him for granted. He's three years old. Who does that? A child can't take an adult for granted. They're relying on you to look after them. You are the sensible adult meant to be. And he didn't like his ways. <sighs> Ring the mum, tell him to come pick him up. Like, why did they not do that? Speaking to her two surviving children through the media, Nicola said, I love you, my queen, and I love you, my king, and I promise mommy will keep fighting, keep fighting to get back to you. I promise my babies with every last breath, mom is going to make my way back to you. And now another pause to hear from my sponsors. As it turned out, David Hadiwa wasn't the only child abuser and murderer in his family. In 1999, his nephew, Benny Hadiwa, fatally beat his four-year-old stepson, James Fakaruru, after years of systematically beating the little boy. Benny was convicted of manslaughter. At sentencing, it emerged that he had earlier served jail time for beating James when he was just two years old. Just like his uncle would later be, he was charged with murder but the charge was withdrawn when he pleaded guilty to manslaughter. He received a sentence of 12 years in prison. After his release, he was once again convicted of violent offenses from 2015 and 2017. Tanya Shaler and David William Hadiwa were both charged with murder. In September of 2015, they pleaded not guilty to their charges. The following month, they tried in Rotorua High Court to have their names suppressed, but failed. That December, an expert panel appointed by the government found CYF does not meet the needs of vulnerable children and young people or help them grow into flourishing adults. The performance of the current system, as measured by the outcomes it is achieving, is clearly well below what New Zealanders want for our most vulnerable children. The panel pointed to the fact that the same children and youth would continuously pop up in the system, enduring ongoing abuse and suffering from poor health and education often turning to crime before being abandoned by the system when they turned 17. As a result of these findings, the government began making plans to replace CYF with a new ministry for vulnerable children. In the meantime, New Zealanders were shocked when, on Monday, May 2, 2016, 26-year-old Tanya Shaler and 43-year-old David Hadiwa were both permitted to plead guilty to lesser charges of manslaughter and ill-treating a child in Rotorua High Court. Watching in the courtroom were several of Moko's family members with tears running down their cheeks. During the hearing, Tanya stared straight ahead, showing little emotion, while David stood with his head down. After Moko's killers were inexplicably allowed to plead down to manslaughter, the country was up in arms. Canterbury University law professor Chris Gallivan told the New Zealand Herald he was calling on the Law Commission to consider different degrees of murder for cases like this. New Zealand homicide laws are a complete mess, a total basket case. They need a review right from the ground up. Citizens demanded to know why such a plea agreement was made. Neither the Crown Solicitor, otherwise known as the Prosecutor, or the Attorney General, who made the decision to allow these defendants to plead to a lesser charge, had, at that point, given any reason for the decision. A family member said of being told about the charge reduction, When I first heard about their charge, I thought, what? Then she explained because he wasn't killed on the spot, but because his ruptured bowel was killing him. It wasn't murder. I just think if you take a life, it should be murder, not manslaughter. The Sensible Sentencing Trust slammed the Crown's decision not to pursue murder charges, with founder Garth McVicker saying plea bargaining was becoming a problem in the justice system. In a scathing press release, Mr. McVicker said, The Stuff website this morning reports the Crown solicitor in charge of prosecuting the killers of little Moko Rangita Hidiri telling a family member that the reason a prosecution for murder could not proceed was because Moko died some time after his injuries were inflicted. If what Rotorua Crown solicitor Amanda Gordon told the family is accurately reported, then she has told them an outrageous lie. 
our legal advisors have checked and confirmed that Section 162 of the Crimes Act remains in force. That section says that provided a person dies within a year and a day after the injuries which caused their death were inflicted, then the killer may be prosecuted for either murder or manslaughter. If she has been reported correctly, why is Ms. Gordon lying to the family about the decision to downgrade the charges from murder to manslaughter? Is it because the family are just ordinary people who don't know the law and she thinks they will accept this nonsense explanation? If so, that makes things a whole lot worse. Ms. Gordon has so far loftily refused to even discuss the matter, much less explain to well-informed journalists why she made such a seemingly inexplicable decision. Without more information, we are all left thinking the worst, and it doesn't get much worse than lying to the bereaved family of a murdered little boy, if that is indeed what happened. One person who felt particularly cheated by the reduced charges was Moko's mother, Nicola Dali Packy. In her first media interview since Moko's death, Nicola spoke with journalist Duncan Garner, weeping as she described her young daughter disclosing the abuse she watched Moko suffer. He wasn't talking, Mummy. I tried to tell David. I told Tanya he's not talking there. He needs to see the doctor. And they wouldn't listen, Mummy. I tried to put the water in his mouth, but he was bleeding too much, Mummy. <laughs> he needed the doctor, Mum. She told me that Uncle was locked in the bathroom for two weeks. She'd try and stay home from school to try and feed my son because they were starving him. She tried to use toilet paper to wipe his bleeding eyes that they had attacked, that Tanya had attacked. She'd try and drag him to the wardrobe to hide him from getting beaten more. So I stopped. She tried everything to save him, she told me. And she said that she was told to tell the police that she had she had hurt Moko. And if she didn't, Tanya got in her face and told her, if you don't, I'll do to your mum what I did to your brother. That's why my daughter put her hand up and said that she had done it with everything that happened to Moko. She um, told me they stomped on him. They stomped him on a lot, that she was getting locked in the room when I'd ring. That she wasn't allowed to tell me things, that Mummy Tanya really hates you. So her word, Mummy Tanya really hates you. She wasn't your friend, she hated you. She just wanted your money and she wanted to hurt Moko because she knew that you loved Moko so much. <laughs> and that's how she hurt Moko. And she used to punch me in the face when I'd smile because I look like you when I smile. And she'd drag her by the hair to get to school when all my daughter wanted to do was stay home and help fix Moko. When she knew that she was safe, when she knew that she could open up, that they were in jail and that she was okay to talk to me, that I wasn't going to be hurt, she always fears that if she'd tell me the truth, then I'd get hurt by Tanya. Because they made, they made your daughter... They brainwashed her to the core. They psychologically screwed with her head. And they made her uh, also um, kick yeah, Moko. To partake in the violence. She also talked about her facial tattoos. Talk me through then um, your tattoos, because they tell a story, yeah? Yeah. In Spanish, this is no miedo, no hablo, no hablo. Uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. This is Chacha. This is my daughter, my queen. This is a diamond for Moko. This is, yeah, my little star, my little red star is his favourite colour red. This is Moko. This is my son, my most precious jewels. Of Tanya, she said. I've known her since I was 16. Um, I met her through my children's father's mother at the Kohanga Reo, where she used to relieve, and then I became a reliever. Tanya was a caregiver at the time. She portrayed to be genuine, to be a friend, to be loving. Did you know about David's history or anything? No, I didn't know about them being mentally unstable. Right. Okay, so when you were in Auckland, were you, did you have contact with Tanya? Did you get photos? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, did you talk to your boy? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and Tanya talked about taking Muko to the daycare where she was enrolled to complete her studies. And being known to me, that was untrue. 
Was yeah, everything okay? Until two weeks before, things started changing. What changed? Moko smashed the window and she said that, um, your f***ing son smashed the window. I'm so mad right now. And I said to her, I'm sorry that I'll pay for it and that could I please talk to my son? And then she said that she needed to calm down and then she'd let me ring. I couldn't ring that day. Well, she never, her phone was off, but the next day I did get in contact with him. But he was quiet and she just said that because it was near bed time that he was just tired. Those are signs, so it should have been the signs that I should have picked up on. When asked how she was told about Moko's death, Nicola said, It was one o'clock in the morning. I was asleep in my son's room on the floor. Benzie, she's the best nurse. She came in and said that she needed to talk to me. And she took me down the hall behind the reception unit into this white room. I um, asked what was going on and it was actually the lady that flew the helicopter the Hercules helicopter down to try and save my son. She wanted to come and personally tell me that she tried, but she was too late and that my son was dead, Moko. And yeah, I lost the plot. You had no real idea what was going on no. in the last two weeks? No. Do, do you feel let down by agencies that could have been involved in saving Moko in that last couple of weeks? Absolutely. Absolutely. As a mother, maternal instincts, and I would have flew there. They could have helped. My son might be in veggie now, but he'd still be alive. That's two weeks before it was too late. Two weeks. They were like minutes off too late. The Hercules. My son could be recovering right now. We wouldn't be six feet under. They knew something was up. Why don't they help? Why don't they fix it? They had more knowledge than what I did. How do you feel towards these people that you thought were your friends? I wish them to get justice. What's justice for you? More than manslaughter. After Moko's body was released from the morgue, he was picked up by a funeral director from Taupo Funeral Services. Later, Duncan Garner recounted what she told him on the phone in 2016. Chelsea was um, working for the Taupo Funeral Home on the night of Moko being sent to hospital where he died. And Chelsea was the undertaker. And she turned up and she saw Mokul lying in the bed, dead. And she was in charge of Mokul from that time onwards. I spoke to Chelsea last year. She rang me and wanted to tell me her story. And it was deeply upsetting. For 20 minutes, I cried with her in a private office here at TV3 at MediaWorks. And she held him all night at the funeral home. She wrapped him in a blanket and held him and gave him the love that he didn't receive in the weeks and months earlier. She held him, she washed him, she looked after him. And she ran to tell me that. And it broke my heart. It was a really tough story to cover. I actually moved out of <laughs> the marital bed, in the marital bedroom at the time, and went into a spare bedroom and lay there over a period of weeks. I just, it simply affected me that much. But I want to tell the story about Chelsea because she was deeply affected herself. She picked him up, looked after him, and held him, cradled him all night, the night that she went to the hospital to pick him up. I think it's worth mentioning here that in 2007, an amendment was made to New Zealand's Crimes Act 1961. The Crimes Amendment Act 2007 disallowed the use of reasonable force as a criminal defense for those parents prosecuted for assault on their own children, and is better known by the informal name of the Anti-Smacking Bill. In this context, the word smacking refers to what we might call in America a spanking. This was a very controversial law that, in 2009, a citizens-initiated referendum proved was not supported by a vast majority of the public when the referendum returned with an 87.4% no vote, although the law was not changed as a result. As a matter of fact, the law is still in place. In the wake of Moko's death, the controversy surrounding the anti-smacking law reared its head again. In June of 2017, child advocate Anton Blank spoke with TVNZ about the country's anti-smacking legislation, saying it saved lives and should be preserved. But we know that these things take time. So in terms of um, actual change in parenting behaviour, we're looking at a couple of generations um, for change. So for me, it would be a real mistake to go backwards, and it would be a backward step to repeal the legislation. And when we talk about those cases which are heartbreaking, 
um, what happens to our children. I think that that convinces me that we need to maintain the status quo and need to maintain this law because for Māori parents in particular, we need to give a very strong message that violence in parenting is not okay. In counterpoint, New Zealand First Party member Tracy Martin argued against it, saying parents should have some say in whether or not a smack can be used as punishment. The language that was being used, the politicians that were telling me that if I lightly smacked my child, I was then committing abuse. I found that personally offensive. We've always argued for 25 years around binding a referenda on issues like this where our citizens need to speak. We have a representative democracy. 113 temporarily empowered politicians decided this for all the parents of New Zealand. The parents of New Zealand need to be able to speak on it. Another amendment made to the Crimes Act was that it was made a criminal offence for someone living with or closely connected to a child to fail to protect them from physical or sexual abuse. Turning a blind eye or closing ranks as a family would be punishable by up to 10 years in prison, and I can't begin to tell you how strongly I support that. Now for one final break for my sponsors. Tanya Shaler and David Hariwa were scheduled to be sentenced on June 26, 2016. At 9 a.m. that day, thousands of people gathered nationwide at a series of March for Moco courthouse rallies via a campaign called Stand Up NZ, which organized rallies outside 34 courtrooms. Justice for Moco! Enough is enough! Enough is enough! Enough is enough! Enough is enough! Save our babies! Save our babies! The main reason for the marches, besides supporting the family, was to protest the plea agreement allowing guilty pleas to manslaughter instead of a murder trial. The general consensus among the public was that any jury would have convicted Tanya and David of murder. During the sentencing hearing, Nicola read an emotional victim impact statement, during which she glared at times at the defendants as if challenging them to answer. She was an absolute powerhouse. Here are some of the most affecting moments from Nicola's statement. I have no other words to describe Tanya and David's actions. When I think of them, I just think of them as evil. During the time that my children were being abused, my daughter was told by Tanya that I didn't love her in Moko. Tanya's emotional, physical and psychological abuse is evil. Because of Tanya and David's action, I had to bury my son. On the 14th of October 2015, Moko's birthday, I travelled to Moko's gravesite. Not something ever planned to do. Couldn't hold my baby in and happy birthday. All I could do was light four candles for his fourth birthday on us. I have questions for Tanya and David. Why did they do this to my baby? Why did they simply just give, give my children back? Why did they not at any time tell me they were not coping? I would have easily exchanged the pain that Muku endured and have that inflicted on me. If that would have saved his life, I would take the beatings, the horrific abuse that they gave my son. I would take being kicked and bit. I would take all the torture if that would have saved Muko's life, but I can't. Muko is lost to me forever. My son should have never died this way. Tanya even tried to blame Muko for his own injuries. Who even does that? Tanya even tried to blame me. Who does, the, does that? Muko will never get to experience life. Muko can't attend school or go to university. He will never marry and have a family of his own. My daughter is suffering significant emotional distress and has to see a psychologist. Both of my children will be tormented for the years, given Muko's death. My other children will never experience a life with Muko now. Tanya, you were meant to be my friend, someone that I could trust, and instead to torture and kill my child. When you are sentenced, I hope you think about your actions and accept that this is yours and David's fault. I know you have pleaded guilty, but I don't believe you are truly sorry. I feel for your children. My heart breaks for them as well. You were both meant to protect them, and instead you have abused your own children. They are victims as well. I pray that your children are well cared for now, and I'm glad they have escaped the both of you. I know that Moko's death was avoidable, and I want Tanya and David to be accountable for that. I hope that Tanya and David received the maximum sentence available to the court today, please, Your Honour. 
There is no remorse. There has been no apology. What there has been is loss of legal jargon and reduction of the charges to satisfy financial agendas. That is no way hold Tanya and David accountable for the death of Moko. Whatever sentence is opposed, I will only go part way to address the loss that my child and I have suffered and will continue to suffer. They do not deserve mercy. They offer no mercy to my son who suffered at their hands. The agony my baby went through was awful. To know that was my daughter's witness, this, this is awful. They do not deserve mercy. They do not show them mercy and honour. I had no mercy for my son. Crown solicitor Amanda Gordon had asked the judge to sentence David to between 14 and 16 years in prison, and for Tanya, she requested between 16 and 18 years. Tanya's attorney, Ron Mansfield, spoke on her behalf, saying his client had herself suffered abuse and depression. When she was given Moko to look after, he was difficult to manage, and while this was not an excuse, he said, Moko's behavior impacted Shaler's mental health. He described Tanya as a battered woman who had mental health disorders, including depression and instances of PTSD. While handing down their sentence, Justice Sarah Katz pointed out that the major aggravating factor of the offense was that Moko was a defenseless and extremely vulnerable child. He was three years old and utterly helpless, dependent on the caregivers for his every need. Despite that, Tanya and David carried out a joint campaign of violence against him. The High Court also mentioned that the offender's treatment of Moko was extremely cruel and callous, inflicting appalling pain and suffering on a small child, a large amount of which was witnessed by other innocent children. Justice Katz concluded that the extremity of the violence, Moko's injuries, the cruelty and callousness, the multiple acts of violence, Moko's extreme vulnerability, and their breach of Moko's trust placed the crime at the highest level of seriousness placing it among the most serious of all manslaughter cases, especially considering the utter lack of mitigating factors. The offenders were each sentenced to 17 years in prison, of which they would be forced to serve a minimum of nine years. Justice Katz told the defendants, I am conscious that, to the best of my knowledge, this is the highest sentence ever imposed in New Zealand for the manslaughter Indeed, it may well be the highest finite sentence imposed in any manslaughter case in New Zealand. After the hearing, a family member said, If they get out with less than 10 years, it will be a kick in the guts. What sort of message would that be sending to New Zealand that you can kill a boy and be out in a few years' time? One thing that has annoyed us is the other charges against those two were dropped. We were told they were going to get manslaughter charges as well as failing to care for and failing to seek medical attention charges. But at the court, those charges just disappeared and weren't mentioned. Where did they go? Outside the courthouse, several marchers gave their opinions about the sentence. Not long enough. It should have been life without parole. I think the only person that got a life sentence here is baby, baby Moko. And I think that's so wrong, you know, because where's the justice? And what sort of message does this send to everybody? I don't think it was sufficient. Even though it's the highest one for manslaughter, I think everybody thinks it'll be appealed. So because it's sort of unprecedented that they should get such a high one. But it wouldn't have been a problem if they'd just stuck with the charge of murder, now would it? Oh, 17 years, it's better than I think most people expected to tell the truth, but still still not enough, it's not enough. I mean, they've, they've, murdered, they've murdered a baby, you know, um, our future. 17 years is not enough. It should be life, life for a life, especially an innocent baby. I'll ask you what you thought of the sentence. Oh, I think there was too too light a sentence. I reckon it should have been uh, murder sentence. Especially what the, what poor Moko went through it was really sad for a young young child like that. They never had a chance to grow up in life. They can <laughs> falsely accuse someone with 21 years, and these ones here only get 17 years. No, that's wrong. Really wrong. Moko's maternal uncle Anthony Packey gave a short statement after the sentencing hearing. Kia ora everybody, we just want to thank everybody from from the beginning, which which this started 10 months ago. It's been quite an affair for the whole family. It's very, very sad. Um, we just want to thank everybody, from that were, each and every one of you that were here today that have been doing the marches for us, for, for, for my nephew, for our family, Moko.
I'm going to end part one here, but this story is nowhere near finished. In next week's episode, I'll tell you about the appeals filed by Tanya Shaler and David Hariwa, the inquest into Moko's death carried out by Rotorua coroner Wallace Bain, and the legacy of change and hope inspired by Moko, the little boy with the big, bright smile. My sources for this episode were News Hub, One News, Stuff, The New Zealand Herald, NewZealand.com, New Zealand Tourism Guide, The Dominion Post, Tikarere, Wikipedia, Facebook, BBC, the New Zealand Ministry of Social Development, Radio New Zealand, UNICEF, YouTube, and Nicola Dali Paki. That's it for this week. Join me next week for part two of Moko's story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod, and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.